though. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ain't that better than meeting with a bunch of God's folks that know what they know? Amen. 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 I'm just thrilled. You know, there's a lot of things I don't know. But you know, I can brag on one thing I do know. That I know Jesus is my Savior. And I'm yes, yes. born again. And when I leave this yes. world, I'm headed for glory. Amen. Yes, hey, I love the Lord. Glad to have you with us. Amen. I, I just appreciate God being so good to us. We had a good service this morning. God visited with us. We yes. had a good time in the Lord. But tonight's another service. Tonight's another meal. Amen. I will be honest with you. Amen. I eat breakfast every morning. I'm a breakfast kind of person. But I'm also a lunch kind of person. And I'm also a supper kind of person. And I'm also Amen. a midnight snack kind of person. Amen. So it seems like every time I get up, I want something. And every time I come to church, it seems like I want more and more and more. Amen. And it's good to be here. Thank you for coming to be with us. Glad to have all our visitors with us. We're just thrilled that you're here. Won't you remember our prayer requests? Won't you remember all the sick? Won't you remember? I got an Aunt Joyce now that's in Athens Regional Hospital. Won't you remember her? Pray for her and her family. She's been sick ever since February. Uh, and they can't find out what's wrong with her. And so you pray for her, amen, that God might just help her, amen, to get better right there. Uh, anybody else got a prayer request tonight before we go to the Lord and pray? Amen. Anybody got an unspoken request? Let it be known by raising your hand. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to ask Brother Jimmy, if you will, believe in the Lord in prayer. We'll turn the service over to Brother Lenin in. And then you pray for Brother Zach. He'll be preaching to us tonight. I felt like today uh, we got out of service and I was praying and I want to make sure who it is. And I went home right down the road and I just said, well, I'll just text him and let him know. Amen. So you pray for him. Amen. That God will just use him the way that he sees fit. Amen. So, Brother Jimmy, you go ahead and ask the Lord in prayer.
enjoyed the singing tonight, say amen. Amen. Before the that, did you enjoy the Spirit of God? Amen. amen. Hey, I loved all the singing, but they were talking about when that little boy sung that song I redeemed. Amen. I've been bought by the Christ. Amen. That's what Jesus did for me. I live not because of who I am, but what's been applied to me. Amen. amen. Boy, I thought of when he sung of Egypt. That one dark night when that death angel come through. It wasn't who was in the house, but it was what had been applied to the house. Amen. And I want to tell you something tonight. God wants to apply something to your life tonight. God wants Amen. to add to you. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen to me. You pray for Brother Zach. Brother Zach, you come on and bring us the word that God's laid on him off. Thank you, sir. Bless you, Lord. Thank you for saving our soul. I'm glad it's under that blood. Amen. I'm redeemed. I've been bought by the blood, and now it's under the blood. Amen. And, uh, I'm very thankful for that. For anything else to say, I'm thankful for that. Amen. For anything else to say, Jesus is why we're here. And his blood Amen. is the reason I can live today. Amen. For anything else to say, we've got to make sure that's known. Amen. That he's the reason we're here today. Amen. I uh, did he. I'm just glad they put it on 15 minutes beforehand. <laughs> but uh, y'all pray for us tonight. Very nervous as always. But it is an honor and a privilege to stand behind a pulpit and proclaim the name of Jesus. I came back straight from eating. I was going to go visit my grandparents. It's his grandparents today. I visited her anyways. But I was going to go especially today. But when a buddy right here texted me and said, uh, I need you to preach, uh, I had to come straight back to church to get by myself. I didn't know where else to get by myself. I tell you where I find myself. And y'all might, y'all might get mad. I drove back there to the back corner of the lot. Back there under the trees. There they was people in here even while I was here. And they, it's nice to hear gospel music. It's nice to hear all that. But sometimes it gets in the way. <laughs> that might not be a polite thing to say. But sometimes it gets in the way of the word of God. And I finally found myself a quiet place out there. And I didn't want to sit on the ground. So I sat in the Jeep. And the wind started blowing. I couldn't read. Couldn't read it because it went blow my pages. I tried to write something down, Brother Jeremy, and it was like I couldn't get nothing. Couldn't get a thing. Daddy going to preach this morning and preach the house down. I'm like, and then you ask me to preach. I'm like, thanks. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I tell you what, what buddy taught me. That's my daddy. That's my buddy. You know, always, but more than that, he's my daddy. He taught me one thing that I brings to my ears when I preach. Have confidence in my calling. Have confidence in my calling. And when I begin to have confidence in my calling, I will have confidence in God. And when I begin to have confidence in God, that means I am putting my trust in Him. And then my calling will be confident when I preach. So that's why when I got back there in the back room, I went to his office. I broke into his office. <laughs> sat down and it took a few minutes, but the Lord finally, I kept praying, and the Lord finally started unveiling some things, and I was like, I don't want to preach the same thing he preached this morning, but I, I was getting a little worried. I don't, want, I don't like stepping on people's toes, because most times I step on mine before I ever get to yours. So, but tonight, I, I, I feel like I have a mission. I don't have a title for it. Like I, I feel like I, when I'm prepared, I'm trying to prepare a sermon, I want to have a title on it to look all pretty, and I want to be confident when I get up here. And I'm telling you, I'm trying my best to be confident to get up here. But we're going to ask the Lord just to help us today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, John chapter number 8. This is where the Lord took us to. I follow this scripture very often. And uh, he really, when I tell you, Brother Dean, when the Lord starts talking to you, you better get one to get good. I've learned that in my young age. I'm preaching, not preaching very long, but about three or four years, when you find something, you better go with it. If he gives it to you, get as much as you can when he gives it. And when I begin to read this, it's amazing. I, it's amazing what the Lord, the Holy Ghost, begins to interpret the words for you, pretty much, in my opinion. And he begins to speak to you and what it means. And, and I've, I've heard so many good preaching in my lifetime. I've heard some of the best preaching in this world by, by itself have been saved by the preaching I've heard. If everybody would have heard it, Brother Glenn. Revivals and, and it scares me to death because I've had preachers get up behind this pulpit that are a lot better than I am. And they're a lot more knowledgeable and they're a lot more powerful with God. They got a lot more power with God. And so it scares me when I get up here and it makes me real nervous. I'm not going to stand still. 
But I, I feel like I ramble sometimes. But I want you to know, I want to give God the glory for what we're about to see in this scratch of the scripture. There's some glory going to come out of this. Amen. Whatever you're going through today, there's going to be some glory to come out of it. Amen. Paul said it this way. He said, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy, not even Amen. worthy, praise God, to be compared Amen. to the glory that will be revealed in us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not worthy. I like that part. He said the suffering that we go through, it ain't even worthy. To buy, oh, my goodness. When I begin to think about that, and I begin to think about this woman that's in this scripture, and I begin to see the things that she's gone through, and I begin, it's just amazing how the Holy Ghost speaks to you. Amen. But if you got your Bible, John chapter 8, please stand with us for the reading of the Amen. Word of God. And I promise I won't ramble much anymore. I'll get straight to the point and we'll get out of here. I can hear Derek Queen talking already. <laughs> well, let us read. The Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and talked to them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, when they had set her in the midst. And they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, that such should be stoned, but what saith thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thy accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. When I begin to read the scripture today, the Lord began to speak to us. I remember Brother Eric Cranston preaching a message about, about the uh, prodigal son. I remember him. He talked about the setting. And I began to try to look into what the setting was at this point in time. And in, in this time, as you read down through there, it even kind of gives you hints. And the scribes and the Pharisees, now we know who they are. They the they, they, two good for you folks, as I call them. They know the law better than anybody else. They know exactly how it's supposed to go. They are by the book, or at least they say they are. And they act the act, and they, they talk the talk, but they don't seem to walk the walk. Right. And I begin to read into this and see what's happening here. Is we see the, they're tempting Jesus, and they're, they're, they're doing things to her. They want him gone. Jesus messed up everything that they had ever thought of. They, he messed it all up for them. He's the right. He's the one that came up, and it seemed like he messed up every, every tradition that they had, every every ritual that they went through. He came, and it's just like he's messed it all up. And they don't like him. That's the simple way to put it. They do not like him. They want Jesus gone. They don't want him teaching. They don't want him preaching. They don't want him testifying. They don't want him doing anything but near them, because they are the religious figures in this part of the time, in this setting. And I begin to look at that, and we begin to see, and when you read about a woman being caught in adultery, everybody knows what adultery is. It's cheating. It's cheating. That's the first definition of it. It's cheating. That's a nice way to put it. It's cheating. And when you find this, if you read in the book of Leviticus, that they did not follow the law. The ones that are supposed to know the law and know how it's done, they did not follow the law. The book of Leviticus says that you're supposed to bring a man and a woman when they're, when they're, they're trying to catch Jesus and try to put him in the trap. Because what, what the Lord I want you to see is that when they come to Jesus, they're expecting him to say, stone her, put her away. And see, if he was to say that, then they'd have got upset and called the Romans because the Romans didn't want you doing any kind of crucifixion or any kind of execution. They didn't want you doing none of that, Brother right. Jerry. They said, you Jews are not going to do that. That's up to us. So if he had said stone her, they would have said, no, we're going to get the Romans. But if he said, no, don't stone her, they would have said, you're breaking the law of Moses. They're saying you're doing this. So they're trying to get Jesus in a trap. 
These religious figures are trying to trap the one who made the laws. They're trying to trap the one who made everything. And that I'll tell you right there that they're not as smart as they think they are. They forgot to bring the man. They're a bunch of geniuses. They don't know the law as good as they thought they did. So when we begin to see the setting of that and what kind of persecution, they just grab the first one they could grab. They grab the woman. They grab her. And I can imagine this woman as she's crying. Because, you know, if you're going to get stoned to death, I believe I'd be crying too. I believe I'd be upset. I believe I would be tormented by all the words they're probably calling her, by the names that's being called, by the things being said about her right to her face. I believe she was tormented right there. And when we begin to see that setting, we realize that she's dead. She's not dead yet, but in the world's eyes, she's about to die. She's dead meat. They about to stone her. They about to do away with her. They about to get rid of her if they have their way. We see, we see the sin of it and what Jesus and this woman are going through. They're trying to trap Jesus and use this woman. And when we begin to see that, we begin to see the woman come into play. And when this woman comes into play, this is where I want to get to right now. We see the word adultery, which means cheating, which means she was cheating in an act on her husband or the man on his wife. And we see this. And we begin to look at that word adultery and what else it means. And of course, it means pretty much cheating. We use the words of sin which are very similar to be compared with unfaithful, disloyal, falseless. And how many times have we been disloyal, faith, faith, falseless, and, and unfaithful? And how many times have we committed adultery against God? And how many times have we been the ones that should have been stoned? And how many times have we been the ones that should have been the one crying and been the one tormented? And how many times have you done something wrong? And how many times have I done something wrong? And how many times have people accused us of doing things wrong? And we still see this woman is still being tormented. Anybody ever been tormented? Uh, yeah. Anybody ever? Y'all yeah. can talk to me. It's yes, so not. He didn't preach that long this morning. Hey, this morning's over with and gone. Hey, I'm telling you right now, there's folks being tormented in our church, whether you believe it or not. Whether they put on a good act or not, they're still being tormented. They're still being accused. They're still being persecuted. And they're still putting up the faith. Whether you folks believe it or not, you can turn a blind eye, turn a deaf ear if you want to. Y'all boys can do whatever you want to, but there's still folks going through things. And when we begin to see this woman, I promise I'm going to get out as fast as I can. And I'm not doing a very good job, as I can tell. But I want to I want to get out what God's got for me and what we've done. See, when we look at the setting, we see what the trap Jesus was in. It was a trap on the wall. But when we see the trap, it begins to turn into something greater. When we, when we see what the scribes and the Pharisees begin to try to do, we start seeing the bigger picture of this appropriate moment. When we see this, we see the bigger picture of what's happening. She was dead me. Now I know I don't preach like this normally. I'm dead scared of death for me. Talking to me. I, I'm usually wild and going, but I just can't do it for some reason. I, I, I'm just kind of, I'm not held back, but I, I'm being, I've been worried about my presentation because I have the meanest face sometimes when I talk and when I preach. And I worry about that sometimes because people are just so sensitive they'll pitch a fit. Yeah. And I, that's one thing I put up with. And I tell you one thing, this lady, yes, yeah, she was she was wrong. But how many of us have been wrong? How many of us have been wrong? How many times have we committed adultery on Jesus? How many times have we put our jobs before Jesus? How many times have we put sleep before Jesus? How many times have we watched TV in front of Jesus? How many times have we put our personal wants, our uh, football, our hunting, and our fishing, and our bowling, and our whatever, what, what things you like to do. How many times have I put that before Jesus? How many times have I put the little things that don't mean nothing in front of Him? How many times have I done that? How many times? The Bible says this way. Mark and Matthew both said it. It says, they love me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And when you see the Bible put something twice, it means it's pretty, pretty important. And might I say today that our hearts are far from it. Our hearts are far from it a lot of times. 
Jesus. How many times in my heart far from you? How many times? This is message is more for me. Eddie preached so good this morning. He preaches to me all the time. And he steps on my toes all the time. It's a good thing. He doesn't do it on purpose. <laughs> Bless you, God. Help us, Lord. But how many times have we committed adultery on Jesus? How many times? How many times have we put the building before Jesus? Well, we didn't like that happen. Put this building, you put the you put your put your different things you want to do in your different clubs in the church and different things. You put them before Jesus. If you put Jesus before the building, you put Jesus before the before the family, put Jesus. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So when we begin to put him first, that's when everything else falls into place. That's when everything else falls into place. But might I say, how many times we can get the door? Another thing I noticed in the scripture, God began to break my mind. We know that she committed those. We know that she was in the wrong, Brother Jerry. We know that she deserved to die according to the laws of Moses. She was in adultery. She was caught in the act of it. She deserved to die. How many times did we deserve to die when we were caught in the act of putting things before Christ? How many times have we deserved to die but we did not just because of His love? How many times? See, and when we begin to look at that, and when we begin to look at the technicality of how Jesus used His Word, and how Jesus said, He didn't say, don't stone her, but He didn't say, do stone her. He didn't say, kill her, but He didn't say, don't kill her. He just said, He without sin. He said, He without sin. That's nobody in that room except Him. That's right. Except the man standing there talking, and everybody else had sin. So he didn't say he what he's saying right there. He did not condemn her, but he did not condone her actions. Uh, and how many times do we do that as church? We condemn and we condone. But we're not supposed to do neither. We're not supposed to condemn them. It is not my job to condemn you, Brother Glenn, when you do wrong. It is not my job to try to kill you. It's not my job to condemn you with the things you've been doing. But it's not my I'm not supposed to condone it either. I ain't got to put up with it. I ain't got to be around it. I don't have to agree with it. Just because you're doing wrong don't mean I got to. Just because you want to go act out that crazy don't mean I got to. Just because you go out and act like any old way, I don't have to. And when we get some folks that are willing to stand on the foundation of the Word of God, who have prayed and say, I don't agree with you. That's the problem with that world. We get too politically correct. We pray we're going to offend people and they're going to leave. It's like I say, if you're ready to go, there's the door. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll be the main one. There's too many folks trying to pet people. And I'm all about loving people. I'm all about love, hugging them and wanting to help them and wanting to do right. But let me tell you something. If you don't want to do right, there's nothing I can do to make you do right. And until you get that want to down on the inside, there ain't nothing nobody's going to say or do to change your mind. There ain't nothing nobody's going to do that's going to sway your actions. There ain't nothing nobody's going to do to change the direction you're going. Ain't nobody going to change it. Ain't nobody. There was nobody going to stop that woman in the middle of her doing her stuff. No, they condemned her. They could crucify. They wanted to. I can't talk. They wanted to execute her. They wanted to do away with her. Bless you, Lord. Didn't want her. They didn't want her around. But they also didn't want Jesus around. They also tried to catch the man who did not come that the law be done away with. They made it came that the law might be fulfilled. They wanted to do away with that man. They didn't even know who they were talking to when he was talking. They didn't know who he was and he was standing in the midst of them. And how many times have he stood in the midst of Trinity Baptist Church and we don't even know who he is? How many times has he rode down the road with me, Brother Glenn, and I don't know why nobody's even there? How many times has he walked into a city of Oakville building and walked there and sit beside me and I can't even there? How many times does that happen? How many times the Holy Ghost walk in where you somewhere you ain't supposed to be? And he leans in your ear and says, you better get out of here. And how many times have I turned a dead ear to it and kept doing what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. I am that woman. I'm guilty. I'm the guilty one. I've been in the place where the folks know it or not. I've been, I'm on the dead because there were no days that I would go 
go through times, Brother Jerry, and I would feel like I'm so far away from God that nobody can help me. I have been there. I'm a good actor, honey. I can put off things. You never know there's nothing wrong. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He knows exactly. Exactly. He don't take my mama telling me what's right and what's wrong. For God not to show up on my scene. He tell you I'll not be doing this. It don't take him coming there and preaching to me. I got the best preacher in my ear all the time. The Holy Ghost of God will always show up the best time when I need it. He is the best preacher. He is the best defense attorney. He is the best man. He is my best friend. Because why? He'll tell me when I'm wrong. He'll tell me when I'm right. He'll tell me when I can stand on what I'm preaching. And might I say, whoever's praying, keep praying. And can I, can I just tell you something? If God said you better get out of a situation, but like God, you better rob your life. You better rob with everything you got in you. You better jump over the things blocking you. You better knock down the people in front of you. Tell them to get out of the way. Don't let them stop you, Brother Jerry. Because if not, you're going to die. Get out of there before you get killed. Before you're spiritually dead. There's too many folks spiritually dead walking in our churches. There's too many folks sitting in our pews. They're wasting away like corpse in a grave. They ain't doing nothing but smelling up this place. They ain't helping nobody. They ain't helping hurting themselves. They ain't helping nobody, but they just hurt everybody. I can tell you, my uncle that works for Barry County, he is one of the man, he's one of the corners if somebody gets killed. Up. If you leave that corpse there for a long enough time, you know, we'll be, even us being alive, we'll begin to smell if we don't do certain things to bathe ourselves. And just like the Holy Spirit, the Spirit inside of us, if we don't maintain it, if we don't keep it up, it will begin to draw a stench. It'll be a spiritual stench that you got on you. And everybody will smell it. Everybody will smell it. Lord, help me get the message. Blessings. And I want you to realize that we were that I am that one. I have been there. I have done things I'm not supposed to. I have done things that nobody, nobody knows about but me and the Lord. And I've done, I've done things that I'm not proud of. And I've, I've not put up with things. And I've had to work my way back to God. It seemed like I had to pray. And I had to ask Him. I need you to talk to me. I need you to speak to me. Because I don't know about you, when you love somebody, you want to talk to them all the time. And you, I don't want to give you love your wife. You can go, back, you go crazy if you didn't talk to her over a week or so. And I know my dad go crazy if you didn't talk to my mom about an hour or so. And I just say, when you love God, and He don't speak to you for a while, and He don't talk to you for a while, it will bother you if you've ever been saved, if you're a born again child of God. My dad is my one of my best men I know. And if He don't talk to me, my God, it will bother me. It don't mess with me. And you can tell on my face when something's wrong. And try to let one of them that I love dearly not talk to me and not speak to me. And see if it does not bother you, bother me. It'll bother you. I understand that. I, 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 my points, I'm just scattered all over the place, brother Jerry. I don't know why. I'm not using this place. But I guess some, some of you are trying to help me tonight. I need more help. Because I'm the one that, I'm the one that has the problems. I know y'all do too, but I'm the one that's supposed to be preaching and trying to do right, and it seems like I'm fighting up your battle all the time. I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one sitting in this room fighting up your battle. But I know what it's like at my young age already to fight up your battle, trying to live for Christ, trying to preach for it, trying to do these things, and you get frustrated sometimes when people don't ask you to preach. And you get frustrated when you study it. It seems like you just know it. You can't figure nothing out. And you get frustrated when you deal with things. And you get frustrated and you try. And you try and you try. And it seems like nothing works out. And I understand what it means to be frustrated. I understand what it means to be mad. I understand what it means to be upset. Is there anybody who understands that? I know everybody's had a day like that. When it seems like everybody's accusing you. Everybody's persecuting you. And nobody's there to defend you. But I'm going to let me tell you something. There's always going to be somebody to defend you, honey. There's always going to be somebody that's going to stand up for you. Yeah. He is the king of kings. I'd rather have him in my car than Big Mora. Right 
there. He's a lot better fighter than him. He can fight with just his words. There's a crowd of folks holding stones. And he says he without sin. Cast the first stone. And guess what? One by one, they begin to become convicted of their sin. And from the eldest to the youngest, they march their happy selves out of there. They knew they had sin in their life. They knew that they were messed up on the last side. They knew from the eldest they probably figured it out first. That they were something wrong. I can't throw this to her. You know what I did last week? Yeah, you know what I did last week? I can't forgive her. Because she's as bad as I am. Hey, She's as bad as I am. <laughs> See, that's when we, we try to condemn folks. We try to blame them. I get mad and I'll do something stupid. And I'll see it. I do it every day. And I want to blame you, Brother Jeremy. But Jeremy made me do it. Jeremy did it, so I guess I can do it. And cast the first stone. I got a little whiff of that, that ammonia stick this morning. <laughs> got a little whiff of it, Brother Jeremy. And we went to the garret. That's what I thought about. He without seeing cast the first stone. Let me tell you. I know what I'm not going to say. It might be going under your head. I don't do good going over people's head. I'm not that smart. But one of the biggest questions asked in this scripture, to, in my opinion, is what he wrote for the Sunday. You know, all the sin in the room. Ah, this is just that. This, is, this next few things is just going to be my opinion, what he wrote. There's a couple of things I imagine that he might wrote. Mom, come up here. I'm going to argue for a second. I imagine with all the seeing going on in the room, it'd be all right. I ain't going to around like that, does <laughs> I imagine with all the seeing in the room, when he's saying, he without sin cast the first stone. I imagine with all that sin, he might have wrote, where sin did abound, grace much, much more. Yeah. 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 He might have wrote, he might have wrote this, when the wages of sin is death, yeah. all of the gift of God yeah. is the yeah. 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 He might have said, he ain't said this yet, but he might have wrote it. Lord, forgive them for they know not yeah. what they do. He might have wrote the definition yeah. of grace. He might have said it's undeserved labor. Oh, but here's better than that. He might have wrote my name. Yeah. He might have said that over him more and done it over yeah. He's going to sin and he's going to do wrong. But they ain't nobody but me going to be his judge. They ain't nobody but me going to condemn him. But I ain't going to condone it, buddy. I ain't going to tell him it's right. I ain't going to let him live that way. It might have said God ain't going to let you live the way you're living. Much longer. He's not had enough. I go by this my brother Jared. More than tell me that's a little boy. And my daddy ain't got to tell me the Holy Ghost of God will come where I'm at. How many times have I heard my mom pray? And I can tell you one thing, Big Daddy. I can tell you these days he thought I was asleep. I'm 22 years old. And I hear him praying by my bedside. Well, I hear can you talk about the Holy Ghost don't wake you up at 5 30 in the morning to hear something like that. He don't even know I heard it. Oh, but thank God somebody prayed for me. Thank God somebody stood in the way when I should have got judgment and I should have been condemned. Somebody stood in the center, in between me and them, in between me and the stone. There's somebody that stood in the balance. Yes, when she should have got the stone, she got the touch. Oh, my goodness, you say, he didn't touch her. Oh, yes, he did. And what I say, this is just my opinion. It says in the first part of it that he began to write with his family. And you know this is ground. This is my opinion. You ain't got to believe it. You believe what you want to believe. This is what the Lord showed me. I believe all the stones that have been cast down. Mom, you going to be the adult performer. Don't do it. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, don't do it. And I can see Jesus as he began to write. We soon did abound. Grace much more did write. And I begin where he seemed to write those things. This is the second time he's right. He's untold him. He without seeing cast the first stone. He's untold him that. Then he began to write again. I don't know what he wrote then. I, I ain't got no more opinion for that. <laughs> but I, I, this is just my opinion. I'm sure the woman's still crying a little bit. Because he's the only one left. And might I say, he's the only one without sin. Yeah, yeah. 
He's the only one to call the cast this morning. Yes, sir. Now, I might have believed he might have picked one up because he was on the ground. <laughs> hey, man. I might have believed he, I believe he might have picked one up. I believe he might have carried it around. I bet that woman was thinking, oh, he's the one on it. He's the one that's going to kill me. Oh, but then he said, where are thou accusers? Well, where are they? And she said, and what she said, well, there are none, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin the Lord. Yes, sir. When I say he didn't condemn me, oh, when I was sin, when I sin and I do nothing wrong, Mama, he don't condemn me. He don't, he don't, woo, he don't kill me when I should deserve to die. Glenn, he don't put that on me and stamp me out. Oh, but he said, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you either. What does it mean when you don't condemn? That means there's undeserved favor just walking in the room. It's undeserved favor. Grace has been ushered in by the love of Christ. And now we have ability to live and be forgiven of sin because he did not throw a stone. That's right. I tell you, I'm getting to think about that stone. And I'm getting to think about what stones represent in the Bible. I believe it's Joshua that represents remembrance. The things of 12 stones. Well, how many stones it was? They're supposed to be a remembrance to you and your children. I think about with Lazarus, how this was, and when Jesus died, this was a symbol of their dead. Yeah, but I think about in this scripture, this is a symbol of forgiveness. How the stone, they still lay on the ground. There's not a dead lady under them stones, did he? They're just piled up somewhere. And you see this rock, they probably did a lot bigger killing with. We should have been hit in the head with these things for our sin. And when we should have been the ones that had been piled underneath a bunch of rocks. And when we should have been the ones that hung on the cross and took those rusty nails. We should have been the one dealing with sin. But there was one who did not condemn us. There was one who said, no, no, no. I'm not going to do it. See, I like how Jesus answered it. He said, no, you ain't going to throw a stone at her. But no, you're not. You're not, you're not wrong. You're wrong with the way you're doing it. Yes, she's wrong. But I'm about to show you a better way of how to take these stones. He didn't need a stone. Jesus don't need a stone. He said, I condemn you. I don't condemn you. He said, go and sin on you. And if one thing I can give to me and to everybody here today, when we deserve death, here's what we ought to do. We ought to go and sin no more. Right. We ought to go and sin no more, folks. We deserve their stones. Just like that woman. We deserve it. Just like that woman. We were supposed to be dead. And I'm getting to think about this verse right here. Right. And it's very, very familiar scripture. Very good verse. Yeah, you're going to get a song. And I'll be done. But it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, we were just like that woman. We should have been dead. Hey. We were, there we were a bunch of walking zombies. We were dead in sin. The walking dead was a real thing. We were dead in sin. You might be dead in sin today, but let me tell you what can happen to you. He said, he were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. So I like mine put it in parentheses. By grace ye are saved. He might I say, that's how we are. When we deserve the stones, when we deserve the persecutions, and we deserve, deserve the execution, Christ stood in the balance. You might I say today, Brother Jerry, there are folks that Christ is standing in the balance between you and all hell. There, there's Christ standing in the balance between you and that. There's, there's the Christ standing in between you. You might be saved and Christ is standing in between you and being consumed by sin and getting out of church and getting out of here. There, there ain't still a chance. There's always going to be that chance tonight. There's a chance. Eddie yeah, preached this morning. preached so good. Folks who look to the altar, the chair be good for you. Dear, the Lord said that would never die. That would never die. My question to you, are you going to go and sin more or are you going to go and sin no more? What's your, what's your decision going to be? Yeah, we all going to make mistakes. And there's folks in this world that can take me and wrap me up so bad in my words and use things against me. But let me just tell you, Jesus didn't condemn me. I'm going to try my best. I ain't going to condemn you either. But I'm telling you one thing, I ain't condoning it. Amen. No. Jason, if you 
expect me to be on with you and Tamara and Jerry and Brittany on the youth men, on the youth leaders? I can I can do it. And I expect you in front of God and everybody to help me because I need all the help I can get. I know Daddy's going through anyway. It's time. Daddy's been preaching here lately. And we went and watched that war room movie, and I've never had a movie speak to me like that. I've never, I was shocked when I got in there. They might not say, I'm not, I, I have a feeling I know what it was a little bit earlier. Somebody, I know a little lady that's got a little kitchen. And she's got a little lamp sitting on a table. And I know exactly what that little bitty black lady was talking about when she said, I just got to fight. You fight, fight the wrong fight, Brother Glenn. We got to fight the right fight. We fight the wrong people. We got to fight the right way. We don't throw stones at folks. I see them just as much as they do. But we're supposed to pray. Thank you. Yeah. We're supposed to love them. We got to love their sin, but we got to love them. We gotta be there for them. And when I say when God gets you to a point, folks, when you're on your knees, I can just tell you reassure there'll be somebody praying. Because if you don't bow willingly, and God, you're one of his children, he chastised those that he loves. And you will be put on your knees one way or another. I honestly believe that with all my heart. If I've been there. I've been there. I can tell you, Mom, there was times when you had cancer that bothered me so much. Yeah, I was upset that you had cancer in general, but there was times when she would go to chemo and lose her hair. Paul, you had that. Well, you talk about Bob, and you feel some kind of, is it something that I'm doing? And then some days I can tell you it probably was something I was doing. It probably was something I was doing. Maybe the reason it fell out a little fast. Boy, he don't take it out on me, but he takes it out on the one that I love. Show me that, boy, I can draw everything. I can, make, I can make things visible for you until you get back to a place where I can build you up. And I know what it's like for God not to speak to you. Or at least you can't hear him. But I can tell you one thing. Brother Glenn, I can remember when Jerry passed the church. I know what it's like when he does speak. <laughs> oh, I know what it's like to hear, to hear him say, I heard, I had a man here, I told you it's me, I, I have a man Leroy, Leon. He got there, I don't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know I was a preacher. He didn't know I was this. He didn't know I was that. He got there and began to break all out names, call out things going on. And I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm about to pass out right there. Because God heard me. When I was unlovable, when I should have been the one killed, he still heard me. When I was the one weeping at night, he still heard me. When I was the one that did not deserve grace, he still gave grace. Yeah. He don't need stone. He didn't need it when he rose from the grave. He don't need one to condemn you. He don't need nothing. He can do it with his words. Right. Might I say, I, I, I deeply am scared for folks, Brother Glenn, that do not want to heed the word of God. Yeah. I've learned, Mom, whether you know it or not, these things that your children, folks, are going to go through that you might not ever know. You might know, but either way, you know now. There was a time, but it had been that long ago. And I was, I feel like Chris I was the most poor child of being a Baptist kid. I felt that way at least. I was a good kid. It felt like me. And I always tried to do right. I always tried to do what they said. I messed up a lot of times. So there was times. I was saved. Don't get me wrong. I've been saved since December the 20th, December 17th, year 2000. But there was times that I lived. I wouldn't walk with God. And it didn't matter if my daddy was the pastor. It didn't matter if my daddy can pray heaven down. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if Brother Jeremy you my friend. There was times that I wouldn't cry. I let everybody think it was. Honestly it was. I can honestly stand your tape and confess before you people that I was that boy. I think you'll need to tell you what I did, things I did. I ain't gonna put on your business. 
That's God's business. Amen. I don't know what you've done. It ain't none of my business. You and God handed it. Now I can honestly tell you that there was times in my life where I would come home with a smile on my face, but then on the inside, crying. Because I didn't feel like God was listening. didn't feel like He was listening. And, and I think about that woman when she was crying. And it's just my opinion about Jesus might have just picked up a stone. He was going well see him, man. He could have thrown that thing and healed her. But instead, he said, I can leave you. I can leave you. Go to the moment. My question today, anybody felt like that I've been here? I do. Oh, I sure do. Amen. 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 And I was, just like that woman, deserved to die. We all did, if you'll be honest. Deserved to die. All of a sudden, I'm sure, Lord God. None of us that have come to the Lord's will. We're going to follow. There's somebody who loves us, willing to help us. Just say, go and sing more time. Get your song going.
Okay, just pray for everybody. And I, I just appreciate the Lord and how good he's been to us today. Amen. Brother Jimmy, you got the best of our now. Uh, this Saturday, ladies' prayer meeting, men's visitation, 11 o'clock. Uh, and Sunday, we brotherhood. Uh, this coming Sunday. And uh, Young at Heart is Saturday night. Uh, Brother Ken is going to get back to the church tonight. And get to the night of the meet on Saturday. And also, since Brother Zach's opened the door uh, about cheating on God, I'd like to find all of you at Sunday school. Um, let's do Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. We have a good time. Um, but uh, it's a little more laid back. If you don't want to get straight in every service you come to, come to Sunday school, get a little teaching, and uh, just uh, let the Lord deal with your heart now. Amen. Amen. You fundraiser turned in by a week. Remember that? Everybody's got the boxes of blessings that have to be turned in. Uh, I got folks coming to me. What? All right. I got that part. All right. So the boxes of blessings are uh, supposed to be turned in by the 20th. 27. Remember that. That's the boxes that are going out to the missionaries of the Southwest, and that way we can have them loaded up and ready to go. So remember that. I want to thank everybody for our special offering. We, uh, our church just had to buy a new heat and air system that kind of lead our funds and our building fund, and we set this Sunday aside to be an offering uh, to finish our building fund. And God bless us this morning. We took up 7600 what y'all do at the church. I appreciate y'all how y'all do what God asked you to do. Anything else before we go? Go to the back door. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> at least I know that thing won't be the cheap on <laughs> Shake hands with one another and consider yourself with me.